Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757 230 everyone. Wow, thank you. That was enthusiastic. Um, <laughs> very happy to have the opportunity to be a part of this series, Running with the Giants, and so let me thank the pastoral staff for allowing me to do this, to, for giving me this opportunity. You know, we a, as a church have been looking at the lives and examples of great people of faith that we read about in the Bible, and then we're asking God to kind of give us inspiration and encouragement from their lives. You know, this series comes from the book of Hebrews, particularly chapter 11 and chapter 12. In chapter 11, the writer of Hebrews goes through this long list of what we call giants of the faith. And then the writer goes on in chapter 12 to use those giants of the faith to encourage us. So you can see there that theme verse on your outline, Hebrews 12, 1 says... Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Well, I have the privilege to speak about Joseph. Joseph's story appears in the very first book of the Bible, which we call Genesis, and in fact, Joseph's story takes up the whole last 25% of that book, a whole uh, quarter of that book. So it's a, it's a long story with, with uh, lots of information and lots of details. But in many ways, it, it reads like a Hollywood film script. It's full of diabolical characters. It's got family drama. It's got plot twists. And we see that it also has a very surprise ending. Now, I want to take some time, so bear with me this morning. I want to take some time to give us an overview of the story. Some of you are very familiar with the story, and so please be patient, but I hope that you'll catch something new this morning. Some of you may be unfamiliar with the story of Joseph, but let's go through this together. Joseph was the son of Jacob. Jacob was the son of Isaac. Isaac was the son of Abraham that Pastor Jacob spoke about uh, uh, just last week, we, we see that, um, that Abraham had been called out by God. He had been told that his family would be made into a great nation. So again, Abraham and then Isaac, Isaac and then Jacob, and then Jacob has 12 sons. One of them is Joseph. And what we know from Genesis is that Jacob loved Joseph more than his other 11 sons. There are a couple of ways that we can tell this, but maybe the most famous one is that Jacob gives Joseph this amazing, beautiful garment. The Hebrew word there, we're not exactly sure what it means, but we know it's a piece of clothing. There's something pretty brilliant about it. So sometimes it's been translated as a coat of many colors. So if that wasn't enough to upset his brothers, Genesis 37 also tells us that Joseph was a tattletale. It says very specifically that Joseph loved to run and tell his father all of the bad things that his brothers were doing. And then, of course, we know that Joseph also received visions. Now, receiving visions is, is not a bad thing. It can uh, be a very good thing. But we know from this context that, that Joseph did not handle those visions rightly. He used them as a way to brag to his brothers. So all of this adds up to his brothers hating Joseph. 
They hate him. They hate him so much that when the opportunity arises, they begin to talk about how they might murder him. And begin to wrestle with us. Should we murder him? Should we not? There's some internal debate. It goes back and forth. Eventually, they say, no, no, murder will weigh too heavy on our conscience, so let's just sell him into slavery. I don't know why that doesn't weigh on your conscience, but, but apparently didn't as much as murder. So this is what they decide to do. They sell their brother Joseph into slavery. They take that coat of many colors. They cover it in animal blood. They take it back to their father Joseph or to their father Jacob, and Jacob assumes that his favorite son has been killed by a wild animal. Now, while that's happening, meanwhile, we know that Joseph is in fact being carried from his homeland of Canaan down to Egypt. And you'll see on the screen, you can see a map of this area during Abraham's time. So Joseph is brought from his homeland of Canaan. And he's carried down as a slave against his will into Egypt. And when he gets there, he's sold to a man named Potiphar. And Potiphar is a high-ranking official in Egypt. He is the captain of the palace guard for Pharaoh. Joseph works hard in Potiphar's house. We also see that the Lord blesses Joseph, and he begins to rise in the ranks of Potiphar's house. But we also know that Potiphar's wife takes notice of Joseph. Genesis tells us specifically that Joseph was a very handsome man, and we see that Potiphar's wife begins to try to get Joseph to sleep with her. And we can see his response. We can read this together in Genesis. It says this, How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. Now, if you know the story, eventually she catches Joseph alone. She grabs him by the shirt. He wrestles free from her, but he literally loses the shirt on his back. She screams for the other servants. She shows them Joseph's shirt. She accuses him of sexual assault. And we know that Joseph is thrown into prison. And there he rots for over two years in prison. But even in prison, the Lord uses him, the Lord blesses him, and he interprets dreams for his fellow prisoners that he's in prison with. And so he gains a reputation for the ability to interpret dreams. And if you know the story, you know that one day or one night, Pharaoh has a dream, and no one can interpret it, but he hears about Joseph. And so he calls Joseph to his palace, and we can read this again in Genesis together. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream, and no one can interpret it, but I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. And I love this section here because I think this is an indication that Joseph is a changed person because this is what he says, I cannot do it, Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. He gives God the glory in that moment, no longer using these visions and the ability to interpret them as as ways to brag and puff himself up, but to bring glory to God. He interprets Pharaoh's dream, and, and you may know that what the dream means is that Egypt will have seven years of good harvest, followed by seven years of famine. And Joseph tells Pharaoh, you really need to save food during those seven good years so that Egypt does not starve during the famine. And in this incredible plot twist, Pharaoh says, I'm putting you in charge of that task. A man who was brought here as a slave from a foreign land, a man who spent over two years in prison, has now become second in charge of all of Egypt. Now, we begin to see the story come full circle. Because all the way back in Joseph's homeland of Canaan, his family is starving because of this famine. And they say, we've heard that Egypt has grain. And so the brothers leave, they travel to Egypt to buy grain. And of course, what happens is they come before Joseph, because Joseph is the grain guy. Now, they don't recognize Joseph. Joseph has grown, he's changed. But Joseph recognizes his brothers. 
And Joseph is a changed man now, but he wants to see, are my brothers changed men? And we don't have the time to go into the complicated plot that Joseph weaves to see if his brothers have changed. But let's just say they pass the test, and Joseph reveals himself to them. There's much weeping, there's much rejoicing, and ultimately we see that Joseph brings his whole family his brothers, his sister-in-laws, his nieces, his nephews, and of course his father Jacob from Canaan to live in Egypt. It's an incredible story. Really does read like a Hollywood movie. That's the big picture. For the sake of time, we had to leave out some details. So if you have time in the next week or the next two weeks, I really would encourage you to go to the book of Genesis and read the story in full. I, I think that you'll find it interesting. I think that you'll find it encouraging. A thousand sermons could be, and probably have been, more than a thousand sermons have been preached on Joseph. There's so much to say about this particular story, and so this morning we'll only be able to say a few things. So I want to talk about three related points from this story, three ideas and applications for our own lives today that we can draw from the story of Joseph that happened thousands of years ago, but that still speaks to us because of the goodness of God today. You know, Joseph faces some incredible trials in his life. He's betrayed by his own brothers. He's sold into slavery. He's falsely accused of rape. He's left to rot in prison for over two years. And yet, in the midst of all of this, we can see that Joseph was obedient to God. And that is the first blank on your outline. Joseph was obedient to God. Joseph did not use the circumstances of his life as an excuse to turn from God and turn to sin. Now, we could look at lots of examples, but let's just take one example, Potiphar's house. He's a slave, and Joseph might have been tempted to say, look at my circumstances. I've been betrayed by my brothers. I've been sold into slavery, brought to a foreign land. God has abandoned me. Why don't I deserve a little comfort in my life? Here is a woman who's attracted to me, who wants me. I deserve this. But that's not Joseph's response. Joseph's response is no. I will be obedient to God even in the middle of all of these trials and all of this suffering, even when I do not understand what God is doing right now, but I know that what he wants for me is best. Now, I don't know about you, but I am often tempted, frankly, tempted every day to use circumstances in my life as excuses for sin. And most of us can't come close to comparing the difficulty of our life to those of Joseph's. Here are just a a few examples that maybe we can talk about. One of these or more may hit home for you, or maybe you can think of some examples in your own life. Here's one. Someone cuts us off on the highway. If you live in Hampton Roads, this is going to happen to you. Maybe on your way home from church. And we think, I deserve to be this angry and to carry that anger into the rest of my day. Your boss is rude and inconsiderate, and we think, you know, that gives me the right to gossip and badmouth about her in the break room with my coworkers. That person snubbed me or hurt me. I deserve vengeance, and I'm not going to talk to that person, and I'm not going to help that person, until they come to me on their knees begging for forgiveness. My job doesn't appreciate me. They pass me over for that raise. They pass me over for that promotion. So what if I take a little bit of money from the till on occasion? So what if I move money from this account to that account when I'm not supposed to? Or perhaps I just steal time. You know, I'm going to sit at my desk or I'm going to sit in this cubicle or wherever it's at. I'm just not going to do anything. But you know, it's my right because of the way they've treated me. Some of you may say, you know, my wife is not the same woman I married. Maybe wives are saying, my husband is still the same man (laughs) I'm married. I thought he was going to change. 
So what's wrong with me flirting a little bit with this or that person at work or on Facebook or other social media? Perhaps more than flirting. We have a tendency to use the difficult circumstances of our lives as excuses to choose things that God knows will hurt us in the long run. We choose disobedience. Paul in 1 Corinthians, he understood this human tendency. Look at this. It's on your outline. We see that Paul says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. What is Paul saying here? Paul is saying, You cannot make excuses that somehow your circumstances are so uniquely difficult and challenging that sin is okay. And to some of us, this seems a little bit harsh. And on first reading, you're thinking, Man, Paul, have a little bit of sympathy. You don't understand how difficult my kids are or how difficult my boss is. But Paul follows this up with a wonderful promise. He says, And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. If you are a follower of Christ, you are never alone in your temptation. You're never alone. You are never alone in your difficult circumstance. We can have confidence that God wants what is best for us, and it is not sin. Now, if that promise in 1 Corinthians is not enough to encourage you, we find another wonderful promise about temptation in the book of Hebrews. We see that God himself can empathize with our temptation because God took on flesh. Christ lived on this earth as a human being. Look at Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest, this is Christ, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one, that is Christ. We have Christ who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. This is good news. It is good news that Christ, God in flesh, was tempted just as we are. And so when we face temptation, we can pray knowing that God understands. We have a God who understands because we have a God who took on flesh. And so when we face temptation, when we face trial... Let us go to God knowing that He understands our difficulty. Let's pray, Father, help me to choose a better way, to choose You, to choose something life-giving. I know that Your Son, Christ Jesus, also faced temptations. We can be confident that God will provide a way out of our temptation. Joseph was obedient to God in the middle of trials and suffering. You know, that is the what of Joseph's life. That's the what. He was obedient. What is the why of Joseph's life? Why was he obedient? Why did Joseph live his life this way? What was it about Joseph that made him different? We find that out in the story as well. And it's the next point on your outline. Joseph feared God. Now, some of you might be getting uncomfortable at this point. You're thinking, aha, now it comes, the fire and the brimstone. All right, we knew it was coming. Let us have it. Hold on, don't check out. Don't run for the doors just yet. I think fear of the Lord is an important concept, and let's unpack it together. Let's consider it for a moment because it is everywhere in the Holy Scriptures. You know, there's only one place that I could find in the story of Joseph where Joseph describes himself. He takes a moment to say, this is the kind of person that I am. It's towards the end of his story. He's now second in charge of Egypt. His brothers have come from Canaan. They don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. And he wants his brothers to trust him. And so he says this in Genesis 42. Joseph said to them, do this. 
follow my plan and you will live. Parentheses, and you can trust me because I fear God. One thing he wanted these men to know about him. One thing, and it is, I have the fear of the Lord. Fear of the Lord is a central concept in the Bible. Now, I've given you a list on your outline, and before you get too worried, I'm not going to go through those point by point. That's really for you. What I'm really interested in is that we get the big picture here. So you'll notice that that, that outline um, or that list on your outline will correspond to a timeline that will, that will come up on the screen for you. And again, I'm not going to go through that list, but I want you to see the big picture that what we find is that from the beginning to the end of Scripture, we see that when we talk about followers of God, giants of the faith, they are men and women who fear God. Maybe I can take a few examples. I'll just take some examples of people that we're talking about in this series, Giants of the Faith. We talked about Noah on the very first week of this series. Hebrews 11.7 tells us that Noah built the ark. Why? Because he feared God. Abraham, Pastor Jacob, talked about Abraham and told us about his willingness to sacrifice Isaac when God commanded him. And when he's willing to do it, what does God say? Now I know that you fear me. Moses, that we'll be talking about. Moses, when he's looking for people to help him lead Israel in the desert, he says, I've got a qualification for those people. They must fear the Lord. And in contrast to Moses, his great nemesis, Pharaoh, Genesis tells us specifically what it is about Pharaoh. He does not fear the Lord. Pastor Parker talked about David. David in the psalm says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the prophets. Now, we've got dozens and dozens of prophets. Let's just use one example, and this is on your outline. This comes from the prophet Isaiah. A thousand years before Christ came on this earth, Isaiah is predicting what the Messiah will be like, what Christ will be like, what will Jesus be like? And this is what Isaiah says. Well, the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and of understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And this is what he says about Jesus. And he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Delight. In the fear of the Lord. What an interesting combination to light and fear of the Lord. So from beginning to the end of the scriptures, we see that fear of the Lord is central to giants of the faith. But what does it mean? Sometimes I wish that the Bible was like a dictionary. You know, you could look up the heading and you just get the definition. Fear the Lord, got it. But it doesn't function that way. God in his infinite wisdom has given us the scriptures because he knows this is what we need. So what we have to do is we have to look at all these references. We have to think about them together and begin to think about what does fear of the Lord mean. Well, one of the most common and consistent ways of defining fear of the Lord is reverent awe. That's a kind of an old-fashioned way of saying it, but I love it. Reverent awe. Ah, this kind of, wow, God is infinitely huge and beautiful and powerful and majestic and awe-inspiring and not to be taken lightly. Fear of the Lord, as defined by the Bible, then is in contrast to a different kind of fear, a wrong kind of fear, a fear that sees God as an abusive, unpredictable, we never know what will make him angry kind of God who simply likes to occasionally smack people around for his own enjoyment. That's the wrong kind of fear of God. And that is not what the scriptures tell us. And that's why in 1 John it can tell us that perfect love in Christ casts out fear. It casts out that kind of fear. There is a wrong kind of fear, and there is a right kind of fear, a reverent awe. 
Which do you have this morning? Which kind of fear do you have of God this morning? Because one will drive you away from God, and one will draw you to Him. Now let's see if we can get to this idea of the fear of the Lord by way of an analogy. Now, let's keep in mind that analogies always break down somewhere. You know, my wife Jennifer is from Indiana, and I lived there for a number of years myself. Now, she grew up in northern Indiana, and if you've ever been there, you know that it is flat as a board, really flat. So from those, those of you who might be from some parts of the Midwest or the Plain States, uh, like Kansas or Iowa, maybe you, you can relate to this, this, you know, this endless flatness that you can just see for miles and miles. And one of the most amazing things about living in one of these states are the thunderstorms. They have the most amazing, dramatic thunder and lightning storms, which of course can become tornadoes, which is a little crazy. But what is interesting is that you can see these storms from a long way off because it's so flat. You, you begin to see like dark purples on the horizon. You begin to see distant flashes of lightning. You can hear distant rumbles of thunder. And any good Midwest or plain state folk worth their salt, as my grandmother would say, knows how to track the distance of one of these storms. So if you get nothing out of the sermon, I'm going to teach you how to do this, okay? So next time you're traveling in one of these states, you can say, I know how far that storm is. <laughs> so what you do is you, you look on the horizon and, and you wait for that flash of lightning. You see that flash of lightning, you begin to, you begin to count, right? One Mississippi, well, this is the Midwest, so one Minnesota, two Minnesota, three Minnesota, four Minnesota, five Minnesota, and then however many seconds you count before the, thund before the thunder. So lightning, count, thunder. You divide that, you divide that by five. So if you count five, you know that storm is a mile off. If you count 15, you know that storm is three miles off. Now, you certainly don't want to be caught in one of these storms. So if you're at a Little League baseball game or you're at a church picnic or you're just taking a walk, um, you know, you begin to count that distance. You begin to kind of gather up the kids. Run, run for your lives. Um, you know, put the crock pots in the car. You begin to quicken your pace. All the while you're thinking, I got to make it. I got to make it to, to safety because these storms can be fierce. Lots of lightning, heavy winds sometimes hail, and they can be frightening, and so you want to get to safety. But you know, it is a really different feeling when you're at home in the safety of a house. And I can remember many times sitting on a, a front porch or a back porch with a cup of coffee watching one of these storms roll in, and it is majestic, and it is awe-inspiring. It is really amazing. So too, our God. He is powerful and He is mighty. And this can be frightening. But as children of God, as members of God's family, as members of God's household, the Bible tells us because of Christ, we sit in the safety of His shelter. And that frightening storm that you do not want to be caught in is all of a sudden transformed into something majestic and beautiful that you look at with reverence and with awe. You know, we see this idea in Hebrews 12, just a paragraph down from the theme verse for this sermon series. You can see it here with me. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom, maybe we could say a household, since we're receiving a kingdom or a household that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Now the analogy the writer uses here is of fire. The one that we used is of a storm, but both can be frightening. Both can be destructive because of their awesome power. But both can be majestic and both can be awe-inspiring 
and both can be captivating. Who hasn't stood looking at a fire captivated? This tells us about our God. This tells us of a God who is powerful and mighty. And because of that, how should children of God feel? The writer of Hebrews tells us, thankful. Thankful. Why? Because he has a kingdom that cannot be shaken. We are in a house that cannot be shaken. This was Joseph's vision and understanding of God. Is it yours? Is it your understanding? So when it says that Joseph was a person who feared God, one way we can restate this, and this is the last point on your outline, is Joseph believed God was powerful and trustworthy. Joseph believed God was powerful and trustworthy. In many ways, this is kind of a, a sub-point to Joseph feared God. You know, there's an interesting end to Joseph's story. We don't even read about it in Genesis. We actually have to read about it in Exodus. Now, if you know the story, Joseph dies. The people of Israel are enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. God raises up Moses. Moses confronts Pharaoh. The plagues come. Pharaoh eventually relents and lets God's people go. And then when we get to that point in the story, this is what we learn in Exodus 13. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. You know, it's an interesting story one that we don't often think about when we think about Joseph. We think of his being sold into slavery, his time in jail, the fact that God used him to save all of Egypt. But the writer of the book of Hebrews, when he's talking about giants of the faith, in Hebrews 11, he remembers this story about Joseph. Let's look at this together in Hebrews 11. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions concerning the burial of his bones. It's such an odd way to end the story of Joseph. You know, why is this so extraordinary? Why is it that the writer of Hebrews picks this story? Right, he gets to pick one story from Joseph. Now, I don't know about you, but this, is not, would, this wouldn't be my go-to. Something about bones, right? I'd be like, no, there's like famine and there's slavery and there's Potiphar's house and there's all those amazing things. I'm going to go with bones. I'm going to go with bones. 400 years after he's dead. That's the, that's the story I'm going to go for. And so as I reflected on it, and the more I reflected on it, the more I came to realize that this story shows that Joseph believed God was powerful and trustworthy. God had promised the Israelites the land of Canaan. It was theirs. It was their inheritance. So Joseph knew eventually they're going back there. He knew that. He not only believed the visions for his own life, but he believed God was powerful enough to do something 400 years after he died. It's a powerful vision of who God is a God who is trustworthy to keep his promises, and not only trustworthy, but powerful enough to accomplish them. Do we fear God? Do we believe God is powerful and trust trustworthy? Do we believe he is true to his promises and powerful enough to accomplish them? You know, this is why reading the Bible is so important, because we're reminded of what God says he will do for his children. This is why we join together on the weekend to worship together and look at the scriptures together. Why we join together during the week into small groups. Because we encourage each other in these promises and remind each other, this is who our God is. This is why we come to God in prayer, to seek assurance of who He is and that He is true to His promises. Joseph knew this. Joseph knew that God was powerful. He knew that God was trustworthy to keep his promises even 400 years in the future. Joseph knew, you know what? I was brought from Canaan against my will to Egypt, but I know that God, even in my death, is bringing me back 
to Canaan. I want to transition into a time of prayer, and I want to do something a little bit differently. As we're praying together, I want to remind us as a congregation of some of God's promises. So as we pray together, if you are a believer, if you are a follower of Christ, I want you to remember deeply these promises are yours. And God is powerful and trustworthy to accomplish them. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your promises. We thank you that you are powerful and trustworthy to accomplish them. Brothers and sisters in Christ, next time you begin to doubt that God does not have a plan for you, remember the promise of Philippians 1, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on till the completion, until the day of Christ Jesus. He, our God, is powerful and trustworthy. Friends, next time you face temptation, remember the promise of 1 Corinthians 10. God will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Our God is powerful and trustworthy. Next time you are facing anxiety or depression, my friends, remember the promise of Philippians 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, Present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Our God is powerful and trustworthy to do it. Next time you're tempted to look at that website or flirt with that man or woman or hook up on social media, remember the promise of Matthew 5, blessed are the pure in heart. And what will they receive? They will see God. And he is powerful and trustworthy. Next time you feel alone, you remember the promise of Hebrews 13. God says, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And he is powerful and trustworthy. Next time you screw up and do that thing that you hate to do, but you always find yourself doing it anyway, you remember the promise of 1 John 1. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Our God congregation is powerful and trustworthy. Now, there may be some here this morning who do not fear God, or you have the wrong kind of fear, a fear that's driving you way away and not drawing you to God. Or you don't know God, or you've been away from God for a very long time, and you may be thinking, you know, Josh, this is all great. This is all well and good, but what about me? Does God have any promises for me? Well, my friend, God has a promise for you too. Because Jesus tells you this in Luke 11, knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. If that is you, I want to give you a chance this morning to knock, to ask, to receive. You can be part of God's house. You can be part of God's family. You can be a child of God. And that frightening storm can be transformed into something beautiful when you are a member of God's household, which cannot be shaken. And Christ says to you, if you knock, he promises he will invite you in. And so if that is you, you can simply pray with me this morning. God, I want to know what it is like to have a powerful and trustworthy father like you, to become a child of God, a member of your household, I know that living my life apart from you will lead to nothing but destruction and heartache. I have been caught in that violent storm, but I want to be secure in your house of grace. I want to look on you with marvel and awe, and I give you my life today. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com give. 
Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.